Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I bring you the Raven, a single stage to orbit capable aircraft. It uses air breathing engines and rockets. It is able to get up into space with a lot of fuel, and it can launch a space probe while it's there. And then finally, of course, it can return safely to the ground thereby making it a completely reusable launch system. Well, reusable except for one tiny part of the launch clamp, which uh, I like to get rid of. So yeah, I mean, it's a modification of the Ares, more or less. We've thrown away the docking clamp, and uh, I've taken the leading delta wings and shifted them backwards again to move the center of lift even further backwards. I've split up the main tank into two parts so that I can shift more fuel weight around more carefully. Also, the there is it is slightly non-stock because the ASAS unit uh, is replaced with something that implements the avionics computer. Uh, it's essentially the same model but with different uh, programmable control values. And uh, that means at least I can control the aircraft while turning without, you know, so I'm flying it without turning the SAS, ASAS on and off. But yeah, I mean, otherwise, other than that, it's a, a launch that is pretty much like all the others. You know, you accelerate up to speed using your jets and then eventually they start to become too squirrely and you've, you've, uh, you fire up your rocket and uh, kill your jet engines and from using your rocket now you're basically heading towards orbit at speed but instead of going into a circular orbit the launch profile of this probe launcher is somewhat different right you see we want to put as much velocity into the probe as possible so what we're doing is we're essentially burning all of our fuel pushing the spacecraft up uh, onto a highly elliptical orbit now the highly elliptical orbit will return to the surface of Kerbin and uh, crash, but that's what we want the aircraft to do. We want the aircraft to return. Meanwhile, once we get up, the probe uh, will have its own power and will be able to enter into its own orbit. So you see, we're just trying to use up the R oxidizer to zero and see how much liquid fuel we have left. You see we get 34 units of liquid fuel and we can of course use that on return to Kerbin to control our landing, pick our landing spot. We're going to transfer that to the frontmost tank because again it really seems to be make a big difference to have the center of mass as far forwards as possible. Uh, for the Ares modification, I also shifted those side tanks and engines, I shifted those as far forward as possible. So there's the orbit we're on. You see that we've basically put as much energy into that orbit as we can, but the orbit still returns to the planet Kerbin. I actually kind of made a big mistake here. I just kind of launched and went straight into it without realizing what time it was. And as it happens, the Apple key furthest from the planet Kerbin is on the night side. I basically launched at midday and messed up big time because it means that we want to perform a lot of critical maneuvers at Apple key. Unfortunately, once we reach there, our electric charge starts depleting. So we ended up having to make quite a few compromises, but we're as close as we're gonna get, and we need to launch this thing and make the correction maneuver before our electric charge runs out. So I turn it around, and I haven't set up any action groups for this or anything. So I ended up having to, to right click on things to activate them. There's the space probe on the back. You see the bracket that it's using? So I decouple the space probe and switch control to it. So space probe is of course running entirely on battery power. Good thing I stuck a battery on the front as well. It uses the tiny, tiny, tiny engine and a couple of uh, Oscar B fuel tanks. It's the cube probe as well because the cube probe had more attachment points. It worked a little better. And so I am just going to point this direct along the, the orbit, fire up the engine and get myself an orbit which grazes the atmosphere and no more. We want to just avoid the atmosphere so that we are in a stable orbit. And from there, we will be able to navigate into our final course, but it means I don't have to worry about it crashing to the planet as I'm landing the aircraft. Well, time to rename the probe, christen the probe. Well, the plane was the Raven, and the Raven 
of course, was a poem written by Edgar Allan Probe. <laughs> yes, the, na- the raven name was entirely so I could make that terrible pun. So now this aircraft is on a return trajectory. It has a... It has RCS systems and it could, can use that to adjust its return. It actually has enough to lift its uh, perikey upwards high enough that it doesn't land on the initial pass, which you might want to do depending upon where you want to land on the surface. So it's not without control for its return. Uh, It's actually a lot better to adjust the return this way than it is to use the jet engines, but I just picked the first window for landing because I want to show you that it has pretty good cross-range capability. So here I'm just zipping through the atmosphere four times time acceleration. We're using the a- the no the ASAS, but we're using the avionics, right? So the parameters are different. It means it's a easier to steer this thing, but it's also not as strong as full-on ASAS control. So you see those islands off to the side. Um, well, this orbital track kind of flies north of them. So we're going to fly over them uh, or fly over the ocean. And once we get slow enough, we're going to have to make a right turn and head towards the nearest island and try to land there. Um, again, you know, if you want to adjust, pick your light landing spot, you have to adjust it in space. Um, yep, now we're slowing down a little. I'm starting to try and pick up a bit of a turn. And... Yeah, it's fire up the engines now, so of course I've shut down the rocket motor, activated the air breathers, and we're going to fly this in. We have 34 units of fuel. That is actually quite a you know, decent amount of range on that, but I'm going to run it at low thrust. And we might actually get better use if we flew up high and, and uh, fired it off faster, but I'm just going to try to cruise along at 10 kilometers at uh, one third thrust because I don't know how far I can actually get on this. And you can see now it's down to 26. But yeah, in the end, we get towards the island. We still have plenty of fuel left. Might even have had time to circle around and find a better landing spot. But I basically aim for the first landing spot that I can find. So uh, yet, that's uh, five kilometers up and 200 meters per second. We're basically trying to run the engines as slow as possible. They're jet engines. Jet engines has have minimum thrust. You can't go below that. And so that's what I try to land at. With the avionics uh, configuration, of course, it is just really nice and stable. It doesn't suffer from any of the spin out that I've seen from other aircraft. I, I think that avionics needs to have a version that doesn't require a nose cone. I like the inline version. Actually, what I really want is to be able to mo- click on the ASAS unit and modify its uh, c- behavior. I think uh, it could be a little more complicated than it is right now. Anyway, we've launched this probe, so now let's take the probe on its mission. Let's take Edgar somewhere. Well, uh, the highly eccentric orbit is lends itself to uh, heading towards... Uh, well, basically anywhere in the Kerbin system, but the the moon was easy to get an encounter for. So I pretty much set myself up using the maneuver node system. So I land again, land on the light side. Uh, <laughs> although it turns out, well, we'll find out. So we, um, we need uh, about 200 meters per second to do that. And the little engine, while it's not the fastest thing there, it's more than adequate to give us this. I think, really, if you're using any of the pro bodies, you probably need two of those Oscar tanks to get any reasonable Delta V out of it. Uh, It's surprising how little fuel you have left after uh, doing these things. So yeah, get myself set up, uh, drop my periaps onto the surface. There we go. The, The purple orbit would show where we would go if it wasn't for the fact that we were hitting the planet or hitting the moon. Time to go on our mission. Time accelerate. There we go. There's the crater down there. We should uh, probably land a geological probe in the middle of that to figure out what caused that ginormous event. So now we're coming in towards the surface. Will we have enough fuel? I don't actually. I didn't actually know whether I'd have enough fuel to do this landing, but I figured I would try it anyway. 
So coming in at 800 meters per second, that's a quite an amount to kill. Also, you'll notice the electric charge is depleting because of my idiotic decision to uh, launch around midday. <laughs> so uh, all, all the best laid plans. Yes, I wanted to land on the light side, but it wouldn't have mattered because were in eclipse from the planet Corbin. <laughs> anyway, nothing can't be helped. Gonna start killing my uh, lateral velocity, and this is a long, long, long maneuver. So of course we're gonna cut it short, but um, or we're gonna chop it up. But you, uh, I think acceleration-wise, we're pulling maybe two thirds of a, a g, so it takes a good. Uh, minute or so, a good couple of minutes actually to kill all the velocity. There is enough fuel on board to do this uh, but actually I think I've, I fired a little early so I, as I'm coming down 5,000 meters up, I think uh, to preserve fuel I actually cut the, cut the thrust let myself fall for a little uh, trying to figure out of course what the altitude of the, the moon or surface is here Without the cockpit view, of course, you don't have the radar altimeter to rely on, so it's entirely by dead reckoning. And the tiny size of the probes have uh, caused me to crash on more than one occasion because I can't judge the size of these things compared to the capsules. But I go again! And at this point, I think I might have uh, waited a little too long. 89 meters per second. 80. 70. 60, 50, 40, 30, oh, we hit it 34 meters per second, uh, demolished our landing gear, <laughs> but the probe is still there and the engine is still running, so, uh, yeah, just to kill the lateral velocity and touchdown! Just trying to make sure I don't fall over because you never know, I might want to use this thing. It does seem to want to fall over, uh... It's kind of hard. The, the problem is that there is another piece of landing gear. <laughs> Two of the pieces of landing gear died, but one was okay, and that made me freak out because I thought it was going to fall over. But nonetheless, we're on the mirror surface. And, um, well, we're still in the shade. We're still losing power. But I hope that one of these solar panels will pick up the sun when we're out of eclipse. Let's uh, take a look at the sun and time accelerate out. Look at that. A, uh, eclipse of the sun by the planet Kerbin from the moon. How awesome is that to watch? We, of course, have seen uh, the opposite case. We've seen... Uh, oh, there's a satellite off the moon. <laughs> We've, of course, seen the, this happening from the planet Kerbin. We've seen the moon come in front of the... the Well, of the sun of, planet, of Kerbal. There we go, and we see that electric charge is rising. So we will be able to perform our scientific experiments here. Except that I didn't actually fit any instrumentation to this probe, because after all, this entire mission was built around the concept of a terrible pun. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.